Welcome to, uh, what are we calling this one? How to Thrive When Life Keeps Changing. How many of you are currently transitioning right now? Everyone's hands should be up. <laughs> I feel like I've been transitioning for the past 20 years, so um, I'm very excited to be here. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Sui Lang Pinoke, uh, and I'm one of the ambassadors for the Utah Women in Leadership Project. Um, and I'm just here to host you and introduce you to our phenomenal speakers. You guys definitely chose the right session to attend, um, and I'm very, very excited to hear from them. So our first speaker is Sherlane Quayle. Uh, she co-founded the Women's Influence Center in 2017 to support Southern Utah women in all stages of transition and growth. And her four benefit company, SASE, uh, which is that an acronym? Yep. Okay, it stands for? Soulful, authentic, strong, and inspiring. Awesome, beautiful. I'm sure we'll learn more about that in just a minute. Um, and which invests in the power of girls and women through camps, coaching, consulting, and global connection. Shirlane has worked with the state of Utah, U-Star, Dixie State University and the University of Utah to build public and private partnerships and foster economic growth. She works with the Harassus Global Visioning Community to bring women's voices to the conversation and equalize social and economic opportunity globally. She also mentors young international innovators and entrepreneurs like each one of you sitting here in this room. Uh, with the U.S. State Department's Global Innovation in Science and Technology program. And she's presented and worked in Europe, India, China, Korea, and Africa. So we have a global leader with us here, Shirlane. Shirlane earned a bachelor's degree in anthropology, uh, which is super impressive. I don't know about all of you. I failed anthropology in college twice. <laughs> it's a really hard subject. Um, and an MBA from the University of Utah and a member uh, she's also a member of the Dixie State University Innovation Plaza Task Force and another ambassador for the Utah Women in Leadership Project. And she serves on the boards of the, the Women's Influence Center, Real Women Run, and Southern Utah Makers Council. So this is Shirlane here. And then we also have Nomi Medina. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, she is the assistant director for UVU First Year Experience in Student Retention. She's a strong education professional with a uh, master's focused in higher education that she received from California State University, Fullerton. Nomi is skilled in educational assessment, data analysis, leadership, and student development. Her interests include historically underrepresented student populations in higher education regarding issues of access and equity. Uh, she's also an experienced adjunct faculty with a history of working in the higher education industry. So uh, let's hear a warm welcome for our presenters today, Sherlane and Nomi. I don't think I was on. Okay. Is yours on? There Excellent. So we would like to welcome all of you with a warm round of applause because you made the effort to be here tonight. So thank you so much. And please give yourselves a couple of claps. Okay. And first rule of presenting, I have gum in my mouth. So um, I'm going to go spit it out because I just realized it. And otherwise it will end up in your lap. I'll be back. And Noemi is going to introduce herself a little bit in addition to what Sui Lang, did I say that right? Sui Lang, oh my goodness, see, I have my, I, that was French or something I just said. Um, and we'll get going. Yeah, so um, my name's Noemi Medina. A, a really great way to remember my name is I didn't win the Emmy Award, so I have <laughs> no Emmy. Um, I, as um, Sui Lang, did it, Sui Lang, sorry. <laughs> We're just gonna keep butchering names today. Um, she, I, I, I do work here at UVU. I am the assistant director of first year experience and student retention. And we are going to both share a little bit about our transitions. I think that the presentation and, and the workshop that we have prepared for you all fits very nicely with um, what Ruth mentioned in her keynote address. Um, so actually, uh, Shirlane will get us started. All right, so tonight we are going to peel back some layers and we are going to be looking at some skills for how we can thrive in transitions of any kind of transition. So how many of you feel like you are in transition right now? Uh-huh, how many of you feel like you were in transition a week ago? 
And how many of you expect to be in transition in a year? Okay, exactly. It doesn't ever end. We're always in transition. So what we want to share with you tonight is a simple tool, but also some really fun things to think about. Hopefully they're fun for you to help you stay present when you're in this transition and cultivate the kind of things that will help you thrive regardless of what transition it is. So whether it's work or school or relationships or friendships or hobbies or sports or whatever it may be, we're hoping that some of the stuff we have for you tonight will, one thing will stick at least and it'll help you thrive. So um, a bit about me, that was a very lovely and um, Wonderful introduction. I had forgotten a lot of that stuff. Um, most recently, in addition to all those cool things I've done, I also have um, another company called Time Maker Remodeling and Design. So when we talk about transition, I've moved from working for other people to working for myself with my husband full time. And I've always done design on the side for fun, and now I get to do it professionally, and I love it. And it is a very, very new space for me. I'm learning a new industry. I'm 48. So you never stop evolving. Ruth's in her EMBA program. We do new things every day, and you continue to grow. So just remember that. It, you never know where you're going to be, and everything Ruth said was spot on. Noemi, we're going to learn a lot about her, one of her major transitions, and um, it's going to be a really awesome way to kind of wrap things up. Is there anything you want to say in the beginning before we get going? Um, as you, as you um, kind of hear about these tools, we really encourage you that the power of this session will be in reflecting up upon what you're currently transitioning um, into or out of. Um, it's that reflection will really help um, to drive a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. So we really want you to be very me focused, which can be really difficult for us um, in the many roles that women, you know, traditionally hold. Um, but this is a, mo a, a time that we want you to focus on yourselves, your voice, um, and and what are some of those really big dreams that you have for yourself? So, see, Ruth set us up perfectly. Who knew? Always works that way. Okay, so are you really interested in finding out what this super simple tool is that you can start to apply if you haven't already? Are you excited? Are you curious? How many of you are curious? Good, because curiosity is actually the tool. And we'll go into more detail about that. But here is what, here's, the, here's just the thing to know. If you stay curious about what's around that next curve, about what's going on inside of you, about what someone else is thinking, you will be amazed at how you are able to cultivate these skills to thrive regardless of the situation. Because you don't get stagnant. And you stay interested in what's going on. So we are going to practice some curiosity and talk about some of the ways that this applies. All right, so before we go into a lot of detail about it, I want to tell you a little story, and it is about Hannah. Hannah is a ninth grader. She is getting ready to move with her family to a new town and a new school. How many of you are 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th grade? All right, that's awesome. How many of you have moved to a new school? All right, have you moved to a new town? Ooh, how did that feel? Yeah, good, so you can relate to Hannah's story a little bit. So Hannah's moving and she's feeling a little bit uneasy about this transition. She's not quite sure if she's, you know, what's going on. And so she decides that um, she needs to kind of figure this out, and she remembers that she was at an event for girls, and one of the things that she learned there was that when she needed to work through something, that it helped if she just kind of got centered for a moment. So we are going to get centered with Hannah. So if you'll all close your eyes for just a moment, please. And we're gonna take three deep breaths. Inhale to the count of four through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Inhale, 
one, two, three, four, and exhale. Good, one more time, inhale, and exhale. Okay, now open your eyes. So did you feel that energy shift just a little bit in the room and kind of everybody calmed down and got a little more centered? I felt it up here. I'm kind of the recipient of all of your awesome energy. Did you feel it? Awesome. So we are co-presenting. Noemi's going to jump in here. Yeah, I definitely felt it. it helped. <laughs> I, I don't know if it helped me get centered. It calmed me down definitely. So hopefully for you all too. Excellent. Yeah, I'm not 100% centered, but I'm more centered than I was. So now that Hannah has done her kind of calming exercise, and that's a great tool to use anytime you're feeling a little bit off, do any of you meditate? Okay, excellent. When you get older, you'll start to meditate. It's a really great tool, and I do it every day because if I didn't, I would not be able to be sassy in a good way. And um, it helps you really take a couple of seconds to just step back and to maybe not have that reaction that you're going to have. So that breathing exercise, there's a ton of research around it, and um, it is a really simple thing to do. Marines use it, professors use it, school teachers use it. You can use it too at any age. So there's one tool. Hannah also, also remembered from that event this worksheet that she got to use that was about helping her navigate through different situations. You all have a copy of the worksheet. It looks like this on one side of the paper that you have. So, considering Hannah's story, what kind of things do you think she might be feeling? The second box, what am I feeling? What do you think she might be feeling about this transition? Call it out. Scared? Nervous? Anxiety? Absolutely. What did you say? Loneliness. Oh, that's a good one. Excited? Very good. Okay. Anything else? Insecure. Insecure. Right. Curious. I like it. Yeah. Stressed? Absolutely. Anger. Anger. Why do you think she might be angry? Yeah, just moved to a new town, first year of high school. Not, uh, it's totally out of her control. So these are all some of the things we're going to be talking about. So those are great things. And if you notice the diversity in those feelings, that is a really important point. Because emotions are here to tell us a lot of things. And um, they're signals for us. So we're going to talk a little bit more about those signals in just a second. So as you are looking at some of those emotions that we just talked about that Hannah might be feeling, why, why do you think, other than anger, which we talked about, you know, she's moving to a new town and she doesn't really have any control over it, why else might she be feeling that way? That's kind of this right here. We're going to spend a lot of time on this one, this middle, third, third box. Why do you think she might be feeling that way? Why might she be feeling scared? Her parents? Thinks frustrated with her parents? Yeah. yeah. So she doesn't know anyone? Right. So the anxiety comes into that, right? Somebody S said excitement. Excited, yes. So what, what would trigger the feeling of excitement in a situation like this? New start. New start? Oh, that's a good one. Did you hear that? Nobody remembers the time she fell on stage in seventh grade. So it's a fresh start. Exactly. She's nobody. She, there's no past, no looking over her shoulder. She can be whoever she wants to be. I moved to Southern Utah seven years ago, so I could be whoever I wanted to be. It was pretty cool. Okay, what else? Why do you think she might have been feeling, what was one of the other ones we heard? Um, anxious. Anxious, anxiety. felt alone. Did you feel like you were the only one that was feeling that way? Yeah, 
Okay, excellent. So you had very different experiences. Good, thank you for sharing that. Yes. Be, yep. Worried that you're not gonna fit in. New school, new culture. So as an anthropologist, studying culture and the way that people interact together is something that I love. It is something I'm passionate about. And it's one of the reasons why I do the work I do, which of course I never expected to do this kind of cool stuff when I was getting my anthropology degree. I just did it because I loved it. I had no idea what I was gonna do for a job. I decided to study something I wanted to study because I didn't, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to study for a job for the rest of my life. I like to change too much. So um, studying those cultures and understanding people and, and interactions and why people make the choices they make, that's part of that curiosity. And that's one of the things that made me really realize curiosity is such a powerful tool, is when you're curious about what you're feeling, when you're curious about your situation, and when you get curious about what others are experiencing, then you really can start to see things in a different way and gain some new perspective. Okay, so. We're gonna switch for just a second to each of you. Noemi talked about having it be a little bit more personal. Um, think about, oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. We have some research to talk about. See, maybe I need my glasses. Okay, our next slides are just some really interesting things to think about. So as you're thinking about your emotions and you're thinking about what Hannah might be feeling, what do we think about female norms? This is from some research in 2013, so it's pretty recent and it is um, US, the United States. This stuff is true worldwide in different cultures. But in the United States, these are some of the female norms that were when, when men, males, and females were asked what was expected of a woman, these are some of the things that came up. Do any of these resonate with you? Is there one that stands out for anyone? Yes. Ah, okay. Being nice stands out because a lot of people are talking about their crazy girlfriends. So you don't want to be the crazy girlfriend. Uh -huh. Yes. Having a thin body. body. Oh yeah, isn't that the, yes, this thin body ideal? So I don't know if you have had a chance to read it, but um, the Utah Women in Leadership Project did a lot of research on plastic surgery and Utah women. It's on the website. It's fascinating what some of those statistics are. If, especially you teenage girls, take a look at it because I am here to tell you, you are freaking perfect exactly as you are. And if you don't love yourself and you don't believe that about yourself, Nobody else, none of this other stuff matters. And sometimes that's really hard to do. That's why that brand that Ruth talked about comes in. And that is why knowing part of the path you wanna follow is knowing who you are and being true to you. And that's a hard, hard thing to do some days. So anything else? How about caring for children or being domestic? What does being domestic mean to you? Cooking dinners, cleaning, Laundry, housework. So being domestic is great, right? We all have to do that. It's just part of living our lives. Guys do it too, except my husband when he was a bachelor didn't do so much of it, but he did it pretty well. Um, you'll find that. And um, can we be domestic and work? Yeah? How many of you plan to work? Think you'll work. Yeah. Good for you. So in Utah, there's also recent research that the, the um, project's done, and 56% 50 of Utah married women work. Is that higher or lower than you expected? Higher. It was higher than we expected, too. I have this, I grew up in Utah. I have this vision that, you know, most Utah women don't work. And of course, this is across the state, so it's different in some communities. But in fact, the majority of women do work. And the majority of, of women are balancing all of these expectations 
along with having a job. And these expectations also are not just about society. They fall into careers and work and all those other things. So um, how do you feel about using um, our resources? This goes along with the thin body ideal. Using our resources to invest in our appearance. Expensive. Expensive. Sometimes it's worth it. It can be fun. I had fake eyelashes a couple years ago. It was pretty cool. I felt like a movie star for a while. Did you, can you hear that? So she's talking about makeup and how you can love to wear makeup, but basically wear it for yourself. If you like to wear makeup, wear it for yourself. If you don't like to wear makeup, don't wear makeup. Most days I don't wear makeup. I was so excited after Noemi and I met earlier today because I drove up here from Hurricane, Utah, and I went in and put makeup on. I usually don't wear makeup. I'm doing tile and I'm in people's houses in a construction zone figuring out what's going on. I don't wear makeup most days anymore, so it's fun to get to put on some mascara and eyeliner. It's about the extent of it. It works for me, so thank you very much. It's very true. Investing in our appearance is important as long as we're doing it for us and What's your name? Kate. Kate made the um, comment that some guys don't like makeup. They don't want a girl that has makeup. They want all natural. That's great. Let them go find a girl who doesn't like to wear makeup. Or they can love you because you love to wear makeup. So you get to make that choice. Okay. So, Noemi, am I missing anything? Oh, I also want to let you know really quick that 70% of Utah women who have never been married in Utah work. So there are a lot of young girls, young women working, young women. Yes? I do, um, but I don't have it written here. We are pretty close. Some, in some areas we're higher and in some areas we're lower, um, but it was surprising how close we are to the national average. Uh, yes. And I believe that in the check-in, at the check-in table, re in the registration check-in, there were the, the information that we're referring to is coming from the project's research, and that was, that's available um, at that table if you're really interested in digging into those numbers as well. Yeah, if you go to the Utah Women in Leadership Project website under resources, they have lists, loads and loads and loads of info. Yes. Um, I don't remember from these specific statistics for this, but it is in there, and it's very specific on, um, there's care, it talks about care work, it talks about um, paid work, it talks about different, different types of work. This is paid work that I'm referring to right here, but I don't remember what the specific breakdowns were. Okay, so yeah, go look that up. These are great questions because it means you're curious. Go check it out. See how you feel about that stuff. As you're reading this research and as you're learning this stuff, think about those feelings of what it brings up. All right, so we got to get moving. So think about a transition that you're currently in or that you're expecting is going to come up. And be prepared to kind of start working through your worksheet on that. What do you all think about this quote? How does it make you feel? Seems pretty, Seems pretty accurate. So you know what I thought when I decided to wear this dress and these shoes tonight? I was like, man, am I going to be the only person there wearing a bright, flowery summer dress and high-heeled sandals? Because it's still summer in southern Utah. It's not summer up here. I was cold when I got out of the car. And, uh, but I had that thought. I was comparing myself to what the expectation was going to be here or what you all would be, would be wearing. And thinking about, you know, how am I going to feel about that? Am I going to be comfortable with it? Am I not? And of course, I ended up being like, it's me. I'm going to wear what I want to wear and be comfortable. But I had that thought too. We do this. We compare without even thinking about it. And it's what we choose to do 
with that comparison and our thoughts about comparison, that decides whether we are happy or not. So just think about that for a little bit as you're paying attention to those thoughts and when you see someone, sometimes comparison can be a healthy thing if you choose to still be true to you. And also, I mean, it, it goes beyond what we see, right? So I know that within um, rela discussing relationships that I'm having between family members or romantic relationships or friendships or work, am I doing as good of a job as X person? Um, am I as good at um, doing, ha am I as good of a friend to somebody than s another friend of mine? I mean, we, we draw comparisons uh, against people that we care about that we're not really in competition with, but that's what it becomes. And it keeps feeding itself, and it, it, it turns up a voice in our head that is all about are we good enough, are we adequate enough? And that really makes it difficult to be happy, right? To kind of own who we are and own our strengths and what we bring um, to all of those scenarios, whether it's you as, a, as an employee or a colleague, you as a friend, you as a, a daughter, a sister, a mother, a spouse, right? Um, so it's really important to keep that voice in your head in check and, and really think about what is it that I want for myself. Very much like what Ruth was talking about in her keynote, um, referring to her brand or referring to a brand. I think that's a really nice way of putting it. At the end of the day, how do we want to compare ourselves to ourselves and to the dreams that we have set and the goals that we've set for ourselves, right? Very well said. And perfect with perfectionism. So perfectionism is also the thief of happiness. And oftentimes when we are comparing ourselves to anyone really but ourselves, um, which can also be a little dangerous, we are perfectionism. So I want to read this to you really quick because I don't know if you can read it from back there. This is a, a thing from the Confidence Code for Girls, and the book is right over there, and I will recommend it to every single girl and mom or aunt or grandmother or any kind of um, role model for a girl. It's great. It's written based on the Confidence Code research that was done a few years ago, and um, it's written for girls, so it really speaks more about your language. But this is a really interesting social note, right? So girls and perfectionism, from a very young age, your girl brain strengths give you advantages. You listen better, you do what you're told, you try hard, all that stuff. Adults like that behavior. It's easier for them, and they reward it. You like being rewarded. Who doesn't? Do any, do any of you not like being rewarded? It's kind of part of our humanity, or it's kind of hardwired into us as humans. We like being rewarded, right? So you work even harder at everything. Perfectionists and people pleasers are born. We're working really hard to do it right all the time, but nobody can do it right all the time. And our society doesn't necessarily give us the benefit of the doubt and a break when we need it, so we have to learn to give, us, give ourselves that break. Boys, on the other hand, they mess up a lot because they can't help it. Their brains are wired differently. And it's okay because they learn that failure and risk are okay. They take those risks, they fail, they brush it off, as Ruth said, and they get back up. And girl brains are just not wired that way. And the book goes into a lot more detail about that. So they get confident. Remember, this is from the Confidence Code for Girls. When we're trying to please everyone but ourselves, our confidence takes a beating sometimes. And this, the, the, that, that helps you not thrive in transitions when you cannot feel confident about what you're go getting into. So here we go with your transition. What is a transition that you're going through? Um, we do have pencils up here if anyone wants to write it down. We thought we were going to be in a room with tables. And because we had so many, we're in a room theater style. So we don't have, um, we didn't give you pencils to actually write it down, but luckily you don't really need to. So think about a transition. If you want a pencil, come and grab one. And note it on your worksheet or in your mental worksheet. And think about the um, emotions that are attached to that. What, are, what things are you feeling? What are you feeling about that situation? We're going to just take a couple minutes. Feel free to talk to your friends about it. Turn around, talk in small groups, discuss it for a few minutes. 
Um, again, we were going to do some table discussions, so we're winging it a little bit on how we get you guys to interact, which is harder when you're looking at the back of someone's head. Um, so, so think about that and share as much as you want, and we'll get you back in shape in just a couple minutes. Okay, so how I have to tell you all, I love it when girls connect. Girls of any age, we get talking, and the energy went whoop right up to the ceiling. It feels so good, and tons of smiles come out, so I'm sorry to break it up. We do have some stuff to share, though, so we got to get moving. So, would anyone like to share the situation that they wrote down and one or two emotions that they're feeling around it? Yeah, Kate. So, most of my friends and I are currently going into ninth grade, which is high school, and so everything counts now. And so it's kind of scary because last year it could be, oh, Oh, I failed that class, that's fine. But now it's, oh, I failed that class. I need that to graduate. So, you know, it's kind of making everybody feel a little bit more stressed and a little bit like, what am I gonna do, so, yeah. And are you all in that? Yeah, yeah. yeah whole front row. Was that what you were going to say as well? That same kind of transition? Okay, who else? Who has something else? Yes. So um, I've been having the transition. I've been moving a lot. And um, because of that, I've had to be moving to new schools and new neighborhoods and new t towns and new um, states even. And um, it was really hard for me, and especially since I um, have anxiety and I stress out easily. And um, it's kind of been um, hard for me to be um, like comfortable with what with the um, school I'm in now and whatever so yeah thank you, thank you for sharing that hey, yeah that that's I mean that's really powerful and it's something that isn't really that easy to do so thank you do we have anyone else that would like to share Sorry, I talked earlier about moving, and that's really hard. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the most difficult part with moving that I experienced was, yeah, it's a fresh start, but how do I want to start? Like, what type of person do I want to be? And um, trying to decide who you are at such a young age. I mean, I moved when I was 14, and um, trying to decide the type of person you're going to be, the type of friends you want to be with, and sometimes you don't have as much of a choice at the beginning, but um, I think learning how to just um, find out who you are helped me a lot with being able to move, because then you can be yourself and meet people easier. I don't know. It's still tricky. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. Thank you. It is very, it's really interesting that you said, you know, figuring out who I am and the person I want to be is helping you in that transition and has helped you through it and will help you because that's exactly, that's really at the core of everything we're talking about. And learning how you, what emotions you feel, that's the reason we list, what am I feeling? If you can't identify what you're feeling, then you're already two steps back from trying to move forward. So that is one of the core things that you can do to get to know yourself is to really be honest about what you're feeling and don't judge it. We judge a lot. We talk to ourselves. We're probably our biggest critics. Women tend to do that. That wasn't on the female norms, but we do it all the time. And Brene Brown has this wonderful quote. It's probably in one of my slides. Is um, talk to yourself like you would someone you love. And I think that is such a powerful quote. It really stuck with me because I don't always do that. In fact, probably 85% of the time I don't do that. It's easy to talk to my daughter like someone I love. She's 11. She's spunky. She's bright. She's fun. She's happy. It's a way harder for me to talk to myself like someone I love. I really have to practice that. And I wonder for each of you, is that something that you consciously have ever thought about? Is it something you consciously do if you have thought about it? 
or notice when you don't. You don't have to say it, but think about that and let that kind of be stuck in your head a little bit. Let that be another one of those trigger points when you start to speak to yourself, especially in ways that is not lifting you up. There you go. Talk to yourself as you would someone you love. So we're going to talk really quick about motivations. We were going to do a big activity around this, but we want to make sure we have some time for some other stuff. So look through this. You guys will all get copies of these slides. Girls. You girls will all get copies of these slides. So you don't have to worry about it right now, but thinking about what motivates you can really help you identify why you might be feeling a certain way. What are your expectations about the situation or the transition? What, there are all these wonderful things that you can really think about. What, what did I want out of this? What am I not getting? Um, those are all really critical things. And just looking at your motivations can be very, very helpful in that process. So Eleanor Roosevelt, one of my favorite people to quote, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop and look fear in the face. Going into high school, scared about getting those grades to graduate, moving to a new school, to a new house, to a new town, moving and making new friends, uh, breaking up with your boyfriend, getting a divorce for those of us older in the room, I mean, changing jobs, all kinds of things. There are, there are transitions around every corner. And they're usually, when we ask the questions about what you're feeling, fear and being scared, being afraid comes up. So are you the type to take a leap no matter how you feel? How many would say strongly agree with that? No matter what, no matter if I'm scared or not, I'm just going to run and do it. You got like two hands. How about how many of you agree with oh three agree with that statement? Awesome. All right. And how about how many of you are like, eh, it kind of depends on the situation. Okay. How about um, disagree? Do you not feel like you would take the leap regardless? And strongly disagree. No way am I taking that leap. Okay, no strongly disagrees. That's great. I usually have a lot of those. So no matter how much fear you feel, one of the things we're hoping that you leave with tonight are some tools, again, so that you feel less fear. And you are able to, when you do feel that fear, have the tools to, let's see if this will work. Oh, we were going to shake it off and have a dance party for a couple minutes. Does that sound good to you? Stand up. Right now, we're just shaking off that fear. Got nothing. That's what people say. Dance it off. Oh, yeah. That's what people say. I go on too many dates. Oh, we're dancing up front. I can't make them stay. Dancing over just here. That's what people say. Go right into that fear. That's what people so say. I'm super shy, but I'm but still up here. Cruising. Can't stop. All right. Woo! I know oh, we do. What point oh, at the end? I? No. We could just end there. So I love. Hey, thank you. So how many of you felt too vulnerable to dance? It was too scary. Uh huh. You you chose to not look fear in the face and do it anyway, right? So think about why you made that decision, because that's a really cool thing. Were you comparing yourself to the person next to you that might be a better dancer? Were you not sure that you thought maybe, oh, let's be on, um, Elaine on uh, Jerry Seinfeld is famous for this funky dance she did, and she was horrible, but she did it anyway, and everybody else hated it. So think about that stuff, because those feelings you felt when we said we're having a dance party, some people were like, woohoo, and they were up and dancing. And uh, Noemi was like, I am so shy. I don't know how I'm going to feel about that. And she was up here dancing. I tried. Yahoo. So do you dance when you're alone? Yes. Excellent. Get the mirror out. So the way it feels when you're dancing, you are 
no, there's no fear when you're dancing with yourself or by yourself. Think about how awesome that feels because that's another thing that you can think about and work in when you're in these transitions and really cultivate that feeling of fearlessness and happiness and excitement and joy. Okay. Vulnerability. Another one of my favorite Brene Brown quotes or messages. Do you all know about Brene Brown? Have any of you heard of her? Okay, so one of her books is up here, Rising Strong. I'm reading it right now. She has many books out. She is a researcher from Texas. I'm blanking on the university she's with. Um, she's amazing. She has stuff on YouTube. She does shame research and vulnerability. And she has learned all these really amazing things. And this particular book, Rising Strong, from the research she's done, what I love about it is it's all about this process of resetting. So when we're feeling down, we're face down, we're feeling too vulnerable, we're too stressed out, or whatever the case may be, she has uncovered this process in doing her research about shame and um, how to rise back up, and it is really fascinating stuff. And it's an easy read, so you can be 12 and still, for the most part, read it. So let's talk about, don't you love that? Don't you want a mirror like that? It's so true, you look fine. All right, so empathy is a really important thing. And um, we need to make sure that when we are thinking about others, we're also considering how they feel. And when we're cultivating our own feelings and we're really thinking about that, we're gaining those skills to be able to recognize those things in other people and have that perspective. So. Here is a really wonderful quote. We're going to move through this. Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said, what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. So just think about that when you're looking at that box and you're considering other people. How you feel and how they're making you feel and what it is that you are cultivating in yourself really, really translates to other people too. And sometimes we have a, we have a um, video in here that you will get when, we, when you get the presentation. It's called The Danger of a Single Story. And it really talks very well, it's a TED Talk, about how we have stories about people. It falls into stereotypes and expectations. We have a single story about ourselves oftentimes too. So think about that story. That worksheet will help you do that. So... We want you to be curious about your situation. And that's where the worksheet comes in. We've talked about this. What excites you about it, scares you? What pieces can you control? What can you not control? Um, be open to all these adventures and experiences and practice getting okay with failure. Practice getting okay with dancing when you don't necessarily want to. And if you don't find all the joy in it, you at least probably get a little bit out of it. Um, my daughter, made this sign, never give up, you can do it, when she was about six, and it's hanging above her desk in her room. I don't know where it came from, but I love it. It's colorful, it's fun, and she was just a girl who decided to go for it. Each one of you is that girl too. All right, last survey. What do you think? Everyone stand up real quick. Please. Thank you. All right. Stand like this woman is standing, feet apart, hands together, elbows out. How do you feel when you're standing like this? You feel what? <laughs> in marching band. Do you feel? Yeah. So the survey asks, am I unstoppable? when I really want something. I saw some people throwing some punches in the air. That's <laughs> the kind of energy we're looking for here. So, you know, do you agree with this? When there's something, when you have a goal and you're dead set on it, are you unstoppable? Can you channel this warrior woman within you to get to that goal? I would say every single one of you can if you choose to. And again, it comes down to thinking about what it is you really want. That's that last 
box on your worksheet, what is the outcome I want? If it's something you really, really want, you'll find a way to make it work. That's that path Ruth talked about, knowing where to go. It's a really, really cool thing. So the last part is, we're not going to do this tonight. We wanted to leave you with this tool, though, because it's really what helps you figure out some of your options and how you can do it. So Noemi's going to introduce it, and then she's going to spend a couple of minutes telling us about her story. Yeah, so on the back of that worksheet, that's going to be your homework. Um, there's a little example, but it's a really powerful thing. I actually teach a class here on campus. It's called University Student Success. Um, and I have all of my students write a personal affirmation because there isn't a person that I've ever known or met or that I think has existed that hasn't had a moment of doubt um, in their abilities to accomplish a goal. Right? And so what this exercise does is it helps you develop, first identify what is your goal, what are the qualities that you want others to use to describe you, and then writing it down. Right? Write it in three different ways, pick the one you like, and then just tell it to yourself over and over till it becomes second nature, till it becomes a coping mechanism for when you're feeling stressed, you just take those deep breaths and you power through that moment of fear or being uncomfortable. Um, I want to spend the remaining time just because the way that I'm able to best, if we can, yep. yeah, best kind of talk about how do you put this into practice? And I think the reason why I was brought into this is because I like to tell stories, right? So it's really, it can be pretty easy to say, you know, just face your fears, take those risks. But to actually do it, it it's asking a lot. It really is asking a lot of ourselves. Um, but I kind of want to tell you kind of how I've come to that space. I can, I can do it, yeah. Um, so this is me when I was, um, I think I was in first or second grade. Um, I'm from Southern California. I'm a first generation Mexican American and also a first generation, I was a first generation college student. Um, I show this picture just to kind of give context of where I grew up in a very, Southern California is in all cities. Um, there's a lot of rural parts. I actually grew up um, with more animals and like people in my neighborhood, if that's what you want to call it. Um, so I loved school. Although I was painfully shy, um, I really looked forward to going and interacting with people and learning. Um, and, and there was a lot of things that I didn't know that people would use to say that I was at a disadvantage, but I never really saw it that way. And I was really lucky to have teachers that didn't see it that way either. Um, it wasn't until I got to middle school that I even knew what college was. And I kid you not, I am, like I will admit, I am kind of a nerd. Because when somebody told me that I could keep going to school after high school, like I wanted to cry. Because to me, I thought once I graduate high school, I'm gonna go work and that's gonna be my life. So when somebody said that there is something else after it, it made me extremely excited. Um, so then I went to high school. I was in high school and I'll give you context for these things. Um, when I got to high school and I started talking about college, one of the things they told us about it is that you really had to be a standout. You had to have a lot of service hours completed. You had to um, prove that you um, could lead. Um, different little things. You had to take a certain set of classes. And so I did all of those things to the point where I joined the junior ROTC program in my school. And I learned really quickly that if I was gonna be successful there, I had to push myself to do things that I hated, like standing up in front of people and talking and asking people to do things, um, bossing them around. My peers in high school, that just is insane, right? But I wanted this so bad that I pushed myself to do it. Um, and then one day, um, there was a workshop at my high school where they were talking about financial aid. And that's where I learned that, oh, you have to pay for college, it's not free. Um, so I dragged, like I really begged my mom to come with me because she didn't know and she didn't understand the value or the importance of it, but she came. And it was a college student who came and did the workshop. And as we were sitting there, one of the first questions was, what, who knows where they wanna go to college? 
And so my mom like elbows me to participate. And so I raised my hand and they called on me and I said, well, I wanna go to UCLA. That was the only college I knew because I love sports and I watch the Olympics and I watch basketball and, I, and they would talk about how these athletes were from this place and then I learned it was a college. But right away the presenter said, not just anybody gets into UCLA. Like you have to get straight A's. You can't even get one B. And in that moment, I felt the most humiliated I've ever had in my life because I thought, you know, I really strive to know things. And in that moment, in front of my mom, who thought I knew everything, somebody had basically told me that I wasn't, the way I interpreted it is that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't going to be good enough for that. And so I was like, okay, this sucks. Um, but I'm going to, I still want to go to college. There's other colleges. So then I just brushed off UCLA and I kept going through high school. And then I, um, when it was my senior year and I graduated, um, I had to apply to schools. And so as I was applying to schools, the application allowed me to apply to up to four schools. So I picked the one closest to my house, the one next closest to my house, and then I picked UC Davis, which is an agricultural school. And I had no interest in picking an agricultural major, but I didn't know that. I picked it because they had the most majors. Somebody told me you change your major seven times in college, so I'm gonna go where they have the most majors, and that's what I'm gonna do. And so I got, so then I had one more spot left, and I thought, oh gosh, like what? Where am I going to go? So I just picked UCLA, but I'm like fully accepting that I would not get accepted because I never thought about it again after I was embarrassed. And I got in. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I was actually in this same spot when I opened my letter because our mailbox was out here. It was like a row of mailboxes, and I opened it up, and I read the letter, and the first word said, congratulations, and I was very confused. Um, and I read it a few more times before I finally um, told my mom, like, I said, Mom, I think I might have gotten into UCLA. And she just started screaming, but I, I just was like, this can't be right. Like, this has to be a mistake. So the whole time that I was at UCLA, I thought it was a mistake. I thought they made a mistake, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go there anyway and I'm gonna just not talk to anybody. And that's what I did, and do not do that. Talk to your academic advisors, talk to your professors, figure out what resources are at your junior high school, at your high school, because they will help you get set up to, for success, okay? Don't do what I did. Um, and so um, that really taught me a couple of things. First of all, it made me, I didn't thrive in college. I failed classes. Um, I was just trying to graduate. I really pushed myself and I knew without a doubt that I would graduate, but I didn't do it in a way that now looking back I could have, right? And it's scary to think that this person who knew me for maybe 30 minutes had decided that there wasn't a possibility that I could do this. Right? And so I say that because the voice that we have and that, that voice that we tell ourselves, like, oh, you can't do this, or I'm not good enough, and we're comparing ourselves to other people all the time, we need to be kind. We need to be our own best friends, right? And when other voices and other influences, other messaging from people, even the people that we care about most, because trust me, my dad was very angry that I wasn't going to be living at home while I was in college. Um, we, we, it is really important to figure out what do we want really. Like if you could turn off every voice, even of the, the people that you love and you know they care about you the most, what would your dream be for yourself? Just think about it. And does that change the path that you're currently on? And that would be a very hard transition. Um, and so I say this now, that's my dad, who was very mad at me when I left my house for college. And he is wearing the same shirt, because I told him to. Um, so this is when I graduated from UCLA. I, have a, my, uh, major, I majored in Spanish linguistics, which I had no idea what that was when I started college. And then 
Um, I had some people kicking my butt for three years to push me to go to graduate school. So you're looking at someone who was humiliated about not knowing about college, barely felt like they survived it, and then people were just like, you can do this. And I thought, like, what? I'm not that smart. I didn't get that grade of grades. And I went to graduate school, and the whole first semester I doubted myself, again, thinking, do I really belong here? Am I really good enough for this? But I did it anyway. I was like, oh, you know, what, what's there to lose? And after my first semester, I had straight A's in graduate school. And that was really cool. And I think that's part of the thing that all, we also forget is to really celebrate when we do good, right? Um, we do some awesome stuff like that you want to brag about and do it. Do that. Tell your friends about it. Some really cool thing that you've accomplished. We shouldn't feel bad for being excited when we've worked so hard to reach a goal. Right? Celebrate your friends when they reach their goals too. Let's see. So while I was in grad school, I'll try to be really fast. When I was in grad school, the whole time I knew I was going to leave California because I wanted to try something else. I really wanted to push myself. I'm super shy. Um, I, my dream is to be a professor, like a full-time professor only at a university. And so that might mean I have to go to some random place for a long time to, to get that going. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do a test. Once I graduate with my master's, I'm only gonna apply to jobs out of state. And I told my parents that for two years. So they knew and they got mad because I came here. They got upset again and I came to Utah and I didn't know anybody. Like I really didn't know anybody. And I just wanted to see if I could do it, if I could start all over, because I'm very introverted. And you all know more than most people that I know on this campus um, know about me after this session. I'm sharing a lot, but that's OK. Um, and so that landed me here. And I actually worked at the University of Utah first. I love it. It was great. But then I heard really awesome things about UVU, so I came here. And you know, I thought, okay, I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna do some work, it's gonna be great. And in the last four years, I have moved from being a program manager to an assistant director, which I thought was crazy. Like when people were telling me you should apply for this, I thought I'm not that kind of a leader. I just, I work really hard and I do my best and I really care about student success, but I don't know if I can do this. And it's been less than a year and I'm doing it and it's still scary every day sometimes, and somebody that works with me is sitting in here, so <laughs> I'm really being open about it. Um, but it's very scary, but, but that's what life is. It's about transitions you prepare for, and it's about unexpected things that come up. So somebody's telling me, hey, I think you can do this, and when I doubt myself, I think, why am I doubting myself? What is it? Which voice am I listening to? Which voice do I need to turn the volume on? Which voice do I need to turn the volume up on? Because I wouldn't have thought that I would be here today. And this is like my mom right here, my grandma, and my aunt. I made them come to my office. They have no idea what I do for work. Um, they just tell everyone I'm a teacher. And then the last thing that I completely didn't expect was to meet my husband. And I am so lucky to have him and my stepdaughter. And that was totally unexpected because when I moved here, my goal was to be like just kick butt in my career. And I was very, had a very narrow focus, but that happened. And that has brought another set of challenges and transitions. But I wouldn't change any of it. I wouldn't change the feelings of being scared, of being humiliated of like feeling lonely in a new place because just like Ruth said in her keynote, those are the things that have made me who I am, right? It's nothing that I planned for. I really didn't think about Utah ever, except when I was a kid and the Utah Jazz were awesome with Carl Malone and John Stockton. But other than that, I had never really thought about Utah. But anyway, I say this, I hope that you will embrace all of the challenges that lie before you and more than anything, Remember who you were before the world told you who you should be.
Thank you so, so, so much for your time and for sharing, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the workshops today. Thank you. Okay, just a quick. Fantastic job. Okay, ladies, so uh, how many of you learned something new? Raise your hand. Anybody take notes? I hope you did because I was diligently typing on my phone, not texting people, but I was taking notes. I just wanted to close by sharing uh, a couple of them. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is what I wrote down. Meditate. Plastic surgery. Don't need it. Find joy in imperfection. Confidence code. Read it. Exercise my girl brain. Reset. Dance party, warrior woman, daily affirmation, affirmations. Noemi, and I think I pronounced it correctly now. Noemi grew up with more animals than people in her neighborhood. <laughs> uh, and she got into UCLA. Um, and the final thought was know what it takes to get what you want. If you want to start your own business or if you want to go to UCLA, you can do it. And if you still feel like you don't know how to do it, I want you to come up here after we close and talk to these women and pick their brains about how you can achieve your goals as well. So um, I want to invite everyone to continue the conversation after we close. Let's hear one more round of applause for our presenters. Thank you. And for you. And for everyone here in this room. <laughs>